Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dr. Astral Webb, and I am the director for the National Center for Health and Public Housing. I would like to thank all of you for joining us today on the webinar. If you're on the East Coast, pleasant good afternoon. If those of you on the West Coast, pleasant good morning. Our webinar topic today is entitled Taking Control of Your Life, a Diabetes Presentation. Um, we have a phenomenal um, panel of experts who will share a few things on our webinar today. Um, our focus will be on diabetes and how you can help your patients control, manage, and type, treat type 1 and 2 diabetes. Um, our panelists this afternoon include Dr. Pam Allwise from CDC, who will present the information on diabetes man management epidemic. Um, also, we have Dr. Rina Ramirez, um, Sandra Aravello, Dr. Lydia Concepcion, and Teresita Lawson, who will actually do a presentation that will focus on diabetes prevention and treatment programs through a case study. So we would like to welcome all of them and thank all of them for their time today. I know they have a lot of phenomenal information to share with you, not only the basic information, but the various types of diabetes, the epidemic, the different interventions that are possible, um, but also talking about how do you prevent the complications, um, prevent and manage the disease diabetes itself, and how do you engage your community, your patients, your clinical partners in order to prevent um, and manage care for your diabetic patients. And then lastly, they will share some of the resources that are available to you as community health centers um, to enable you to provide this managed care. So again, thank you, everyone. Um, I, we're going to begin with Dr. Pamela Allwise, um, followed by Dr. Rino Ramirez, um, Terry Lawson, um, then Sandra Aravello and uh, Dr. Lydia Concepcion. So again, thank you. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Pam Allwise. I'm from CDC. Thank you for um, inviting me. Um, this is uh, National Diabetes Month. And uh, on the 14th, two days ago, it was um, Diabetes Day, uh, trying to increase the awareness of everybody that we definitely do have an epidemic of diabetes. And when you see from Time and Newsweek, et cetera, that we have an American epidemic, the problem is that these were just from a few years ago. And as you see from Newsweek, it said 16 million. And now we have almost 26 million people who have um, diabetes. Uh, CDC is known for its um, maps. And um, oh, let me just get the screen a little bit uh, clearer here. Um, and we know that we have an epidemic of obesity. And uh, you can see that um, we almost can superimpose the number of people who have obesity and diabetes. And if you look from 1994 to 2009, you can see how there's been an obesity epidemic and with that, um, a diabetes epidemic as well. So we have 20 six million people with diabetes, but we have another 79 million people with prediabetes. And there are all kinds of terms in people's minds about what prediabetes is. Really prediabetes is when a person's blood sugar is higher than a person who doesn't have any blood sugar problems, but not high enough to have a formal diagnosis of diabetes. Folks with prediabetes have a real condition. It isn't a touch of sugar. It isn't borderline diabetes. It really is a condition. And we'll talk about interventions later. But we have to remember that people who do have prediabetes, otherwise known as borderline or whatever, definitely have an increased risk for developing heart disease and stroke. So we want to identify and treat those folks as well. Um, almost 2 million new cases of diabetes uh, were diagnosed in people over the age of 20 in 2011. Um, and we can see in this slide that it keeps on going up. When we look from 1958 to now, we see that the number and the percentage of people with diabetes just keeps growing. 
Um, when we look at the lifetime risk of people in the U.S. who might um, develop diabetes, we can see that in some populations, almost 50% um, have an increased risk of developing diabetes. So this is really um, a call to action here. When we look at the age group, and everybody's getting older, we can see that especially in the Medicare population, um, all, all, over a quarter of the people over age 65 have some problem with processing their sugar. They either, they either have diabetes or prediabetes. And we definitely have evidence-based interventions um, for both. And we know by 2050, if current trends continue, one in three adult Americans will have diabetes. So we want to decrease these trends. Um, and we know that we have to have earlier diagnosis. We know that we have to identify people at risk. Also, the cost. And this study was done several years ago. But 174 billion, with a B, people have, um, excuse me, $174 billion is the cost of um, people who have diabetes. And all kinds of costs from, of course, hospitalization. But we're also talking about other costs. Um, sometimes people uh, at the work site may not be performing as efficiently if they're not treated, as w um, if their treatment plan is not as up to date as it should be. So we say that the productivity might be decreased, but once again, if we follow really good interventions, etc., we can improve all of these numbers. I wanted to give you a little basic diabetes um, 101. Because diabetes is not just a sugar problem. It's the interaction of food, of insulin, of other hormones, physical activity, genes, etc. Everything kind of will come to play when we talk about diabetes. We also have other associated conditions with diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And it's the complications of diabetes, not just the diagnosis that will cause the problems. So we know that diabetes is common. We know that it's serious. But we also know that it's very, very treatable. We know that diabetes means two times the risk of having high blood pressure, two times the risk of having heart disease. And we have to remember, we have to make that link between diabetes and heart disease. Two to, two to four times increased risk of having a stroke. We know that diabetes is the number one cause of new uh, onset blindness in adults, kidney failure. We also know that 60% of the non-traumatic lower limb amputations are due to diabetes. So the complications can be devastating, but once again, early diagnosis, early treatment can certainly decrease these outcomes. So we know that eye disease, kidney disease, we also know that people can have nerve damage, neuropathy. So people can have pain. They'll have decreased feeling. We don't want people to go barefoot, for instance, because they might not feel something sharp. We also have to remember that depression is very, very common in anybody who will have a chronic condition, and also with diabetes as an example of a chronic condition. So we always want to screen folks for any mental health issues, but especially um, depression. When we treat people um, for diabetes to try to prevent these complications, for instance, some people um, might use multiple shots or whatever. Or they might be in multiple medicines. It doesn't mean that they have worse diabetes. When we talk about diabetes, we want to talk about their complications, not just their diabetes. But we also have evidence that if we control their blood sugar, get it as close to normal as possible, but each person has to have their own treatment plan depending on their other um, uh, conditions, etc. But if we can keep the sugars as close to normal as possible, we might be able to decrease these complications. And I'm going to show you some of the evidence in a minute. What are some of the symptoms of diabetes? Well, certainly frequent urination. People can be very thirsty. Sometimes people can lose weight, especially if they have type 1 diabetes. Many times people are tired. They can have blurred vision, slow healing, um, cuts or sores. But often people do not have any symptoms. So sometimes people need to be screened. 
I just wanted you to have what's the formal diagnosis of diabetes, and these slides will be published, okay? Um, if a fasting sugar is over 126, a person will have diabetes. If a person has the classic symptoms and has a random sugar of over 200, a person will have diabetes. And we also talk about a hemoglobin A1C, or an average blood sugar test. It goes back about three months. Everybody has a normal percent, but if the percentage is over 6.5, that means that a person has diabetes. I want to talk about the types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes classically has been in people who might be less than 20 years old. People usually um, are very thin, but you can be any age. You can be 15 or 50. I had a patient who weighed 72 pounds and she was 72 years old. She, yes, she was an adult with newly diagnosed diabetes, but she had type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is when the pancreas poops out. Those beta cells that make insulin just aren't working anymore. About 5 to 10 percent, uh, about 10 percent of people have type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is far more common. Classically, people over 40 overweight, but we are seeing it in children as well with our obesity epidemic. And this is probably about 80 to 90 percent of people who have type 2 diabetes. People have prediabetes that we've talked about, and also gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes can be very common um, in many populations. After uh, the baby's delivered, the diabetes might go away, but these women have a 35 to 60 percent increased chance for developing diabetes later in life. So it's always good to ask. I had a patient who was 65, and I said, so how many ch children do you have? And were any of them over 9 pounds? And she said, but Dr. A, I'm not going to have any more babies. Yes, we knew that. But it's a window on the future. You can help people understand if they're going to develop diabetes. So who's at risk for developing diabetes? Well, if people are over 45, overweight, if they have high blood pressure, we see that in many ethnic or minority populations, an increased risk for developing a diabetes. Um, family history, boy, genes are strong. So we know that. Um, uh, there's something called polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, where people don't digest their sugars as well as they should. And there we call it insulin resistance. Their insulin is not as efficient as they should be as well. And also we talk about gestational diabetes, women who have diabetes when they are pregnant. Um, if you look at the American Diabetes Association, there's a risk test that you can take. Um, you can show to many of your clients just to know if they are at risk. We also, when I was talking about prediabetes, we have numbers for those as well. A normal sugar should be less than 100. But if a sugar is between 100 and 125, that's prediabetes. A normal sugar after a person eats should be less than 140. And if a person has diabetes, it's over 200. How do you classify the people that will have a blood sugar between 141 and 199? They have prediabetes. We can also look at their average blood sugar over a few months. A1C levels of 5.7 to 6.4. That's a test that can be done right then. No fasting. It doesn't matter. You will get the result. And we'll talk about interventions in a bit. So we can diagnose the people. Now what do we do? Does better sugar control lead to better outcomes? And the answer is yes. For every 1% improvement in the A1C, the average blood sugar test, you can decrease the risk by 40% decrease your risk of eye disease or kidney disease. So that's really impressive. There was a study um, that looked at people, um, the Diabetes Control and Complications trial, and when they kept the blood sugars in a certain range, you can see they decreased the risk of eye disease, retinopathy by 63%, nephropathy or kidney disease by 54%, and the nerve damage by 60%. So we know that better control will work. We also talk about controlling the ABCs. It isn't just enough to control blood sugar levels. We, a is A1C, average blood sugar level. B is blood pressure control. C is cholesterol control. And S 
even if the smallest, smoking cessation, all tobacco products. We have a new math, one and one equals three. So if a person has diabetes and smokes and has high blood pressure, you're going to increase the risk of eye disease, especially if a person smokes. Now, we have many causes of high blood sugar, especially in type 2 diabetes. And um, we look at the physiology so that we have interactions in the liver, in the pancreas, and also in the muscle cells where we have receptors or keyholes for insulin. And we have medicine for every single interaction. So we have medication that will help the pancreas. We have medication that um, is metabolized in the liver. We also have medicine that will help those receptors, those keyholes, recognize and use insulin more efficiently. When we look at how many people are on oral agents, are on insulin, etc., cetera, um, about 12% are on insulin only, and people can have type 1 or type 2 diabetes and be on insulin. Um, we see about 14% of those, we have 14% of people who are on both, and some people are on um, oral medicine only. But 16% of people have diabetes and aren't on any therapy whatsoever. So we want to identify those people and treat them as much as we can. Now, everybody um, has um, insulin if they don't have diabetes. And the normal pancreas works by putting out a little bit of insulin every hour. And then when a person eats, we'll have a bolus, we'll have a blip of insulin. That's physiology. And if a person is on insulin, we try to mimic what a pancreas that's supposedly working normally will do. So that you might see um, people with diabetes on multiple shots. And this is the reason, because we're trying to mimic what a normal pancreas will do. So the last thing I want to talk about are what are some resources in the public domain and how can we use them. When we talk about the community partner, we talk about where people live, work, play, and pray. So it could be the work site, it can be um, a YMCA, it can be a church. There are many, many resources out there. One resource is the National Diabetes Education Program, which is a joint CDC and NIH program. We have over 200 partners. Please visit the website, yourdiabetesinfo.org. Our partners have helped us develop many, many different resources. There is no copyright. We have resources about prevention of diabetes. We have resources on foot care, what to eat, activity, etc. Uh, we have prints, we have downloads, we have videos, and we have PowerPoint presentations. We also have many different materials for consumers, for healthcare providers, tips to stay healthy. We also have the basic diabetes uh, info in multiple languages, um, from Bengali, Spanish, Urdu, and Haitian Creole as well. And many people only speak the language, so we have that on um, a CD, so uh, people can understand it as well. We have materials for professionals and for lay workers, so that if you have any health coaches, promotoras, or whatever, we have the Road to Health a toolkit that you can order, and it's really helpful. It's like a programmed approach for promotoras to help um, the community. Uh, its focus, was, we have two different versions. Um, of course, we have one in Spanish, but for the Hispanic Latino population, as well for the African American population. But many of these things are colorblind and um, can be used for anybody if we would like to prevent or treat diabetes. We have other um, websites. Uh, we have Better Diabetes Care for Health Professionals and Diabetes at Work for people, for offices and employers. We have Lunch and Learn products as well. A new product is a photo novella. It's almost like a fancy comic book. And it's talking about making good food choices, um, trying to prevent diabetes as well. It's in English and in Spanish. It was focus tested, and people just loved it. Very um, easy to understand. And it made people think about what they were doing. We have recipe books please visit. Um, we have things you can hang up it, so people don't have to eat like a bird to prevent diabetes. 
uh, healthy food choices. Some words of wisdom, you can't transform everything at once. Use the resources to print out forms and recipes. Don't reinvent the wheel. The last thing I'm going to talk about is the diabetes prevention program. Um, there was a research study done several years ago that looked at people with prediabetes, and they looked at interventions to try to prevent them from developing formal diabetes. It turned out that lifestyle did better than medication. And people didn't have to lose 82 pounds. They only had to lose by 5 to 7 percent. That would translate to 10 to 15 pounds and do physical activity, moderate physical activity, for 30 minutes five days a week. And they decreased their risk by almost 60 percent. So uh, CDC has been trying to systematically scale this program so that the millions of people who have prediabetes can take advantage of this. A few years ago in the New York Times, there was an article about this, how CDC, United Healthcare, and the YMCA of America are all getting together to have this program. Um, and uh, here is the information. Um, the website, and you can see if there's a YMCA program or other provider in your area. Um, people can be trained if there's an infrastructure. So we invite many people to look at this program, see if they can get involved, see if they can be trained. So we have a training module. We have a recognition program to assure quality. You can get all of this information on the cdc.gov diabetes slash prevention um, website. So please visit our resources. I thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ramirez. Hello, everyone. Pam, that was really wonderful, a great overview of diabetes and all the wonderful resources that are out there for us to use. I'm going to speak a little bit of how we approach diabetes using uh, one of the many methods um, we use uh, clinical pharmacy services uh, to provide specialized care to our patients with diabetes. But first, let me talk to you about Football Health Center. Uh, we were established in 1990 uh, by a Dr. Sufo and his wife. Um, Dr. Sufo was a urologist who retired from private practice and saw the need for free health care in Dover. And they established a uh, Dover free clinic. Uh, with the help of physician friends who volunteered their time to provide acute care and walk-in services. They used the church basement, talk about resources in the community. Services then expanded to primary and preventive care, and the center became an FQHC in 2004. As of today, uh, we, we have expanded our, our services to four sites and serve four counties, as you see in the stars there. And we have special populations designation, including residents of public housing. Last year, we saw over 15,000 patients, most of whom were under poverty level, 70% had no insurance, and the majority are Hispanic or members of other minority groups. Most of the patients that we see are adults and have a growing population of seniors, many who live in public housing. We are here for our patients, and we're open seven days a week. Um, we have here a listing of some of the core services that we provide. As, we, as other SQHC, we provide primary health and me, primary medical and dental services with emphasis on prevention, prevention and co chronic, care, um, uh, chronic care and continuity of care. We have funding for additional programs that enrich our services, including Ryan White, podiatry services, behavioral health, patient navigation, a breast cancer support group, and clinical pharmacy services. These are, again, a listing of some of our special programs, but I do want to highlight clinical pharmacy services because that's the method that we're using to take care of our patients with diabetes. It is significant through the, it is through the clinical pharmacy services that we have found to have a significant and positive impact on our patients with severe disparities in health care who also have chronic conditions such as diabetes. The clinical pharmacist is a member of the care team and receives referrals from primary care providers. She sees the most complex patients with diabetes, patients who are struggling with financial, social, cultural, and behavioral issues that interfere with their getting their diabetes under control. It is through that interaction that we have helped over 600 patients with diabetes over the past three years through that program. 
Now I'm showing you one of our sites um, where Terry, our clinical pharmacist, takes care of our patients, uh, our case study, Mr. FP. She sees him at her Morristown site, one block away from his apartment at a nearby public housing building. I'm also showing you our mobile van because during the recent storm, our site lost power for three days and we were parked right outside so that we can continue to provide care. Now I'm going to turn it over to Terry to tell you about FP. Hello everyone and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all today. I want to introduce Mr. FP to you. He's a 57-year-old Latino man who at the time of presentation had had uh, diabetes for 20 years. Uh, when first uh, uh, presented, his A1C was 10.1% in January of 2011. And uh, if you all listened to Pam before, uh, that's way over the uh, normal range for A1C. He presented with uh, pretty significant barriers, uh, isolation, loneliness. He had low self-esteem, social and cultural barriers. Uh, he had somewhat of a denial level uh, with respect to diabetes. He has a low health literacy level. And he also was non-adherent to his medication. He was on multiple oral diabetic uh, medications like metformin and glipizide, Genovia, and Starlix, and did not want to go on insulin. So how did we help Mr. FP? For the next two months, we met with uh, FP, and he also met with the uh, uh, provider. He still resisted going on, on insulin. And he also uh, had a tendency to keep avoiding follow-up visits. However, as a team, we did not give up on Mr. FP. We kept calling and we kept rescheduling his appointments. Eventually, he would come in. And at every visit, we would discuss his situation, building trust with every visit. We asked open-ended questions sort of like peeling an onion, trying to figure out what's going on with this patient. But as you're peeling the layers of this onion, you're also building trust, allowing the patient to feel at ease and understand that we are his partners and that he is also very much in charge of his own health. So we reviewed all aspects of living with diabetes with him on a constant basis always using motivational techniques and giving encouragement. We reviewed how he was self-caring for himself at every visit, for example, monitoring, which he was not doing when first presented, and now he's at a very proficient level. So eventually, he took steps towards self-management, towards those constant follow-up visits and education. We started him on insulin in May of 2011. By July of 2011, his A1C came down to 7.8%. Patient sees the progress here between an A1C of 10.1% and an A1C of 7.8. He sees that he's getting better. He was also very much in, in, encouraged by not having to take so many oral medications for they were discontinued one by one as he got better. So diabetes self-management education enabled and empowered the patient to deal with his setbacks, although always present. He would admit them, and then we would have the opportunity to discuss new goals to help him overcome the barriers. So for example, one of the setbacks that Mr. FP suffered was that because of his loneliness and isolation, he uh, got together with a buddy who loves Mexican food, and he would go out three times a week to eat Mexican food, uh, of course, causing a setback in his self-management control and an increase in his A1C. However, what's significant about this is that the patient felt at ease to disclose this behavior, and we were able to turn it around for him. So despite these setbacks and challenges, FP now keeps every appointment he has with the pharmacist as well as with the provider. So what helped this patient? 
frequent follow-up with the same provider, keeping continuity of care, as well as with the clinical pharmacist and staff collaborating with the provider and the patient. Consistent what's in it for me motivation. Patients uh, need to understand what is in it for them. Uh, it no longer wakes, uh, works to tell them to take two aspirin and call me in the morning. Uh, lowering and slim simplifying his medication regimen was also an extremely significant uh, barrier to break for him, and it was uh, a very positive move towards uh, the patient involvement and engagement in his own care. Teamwork and collaboration involving the patient at the center of his care is also uh, extremely essential in allowing this patient to move forward. So he's involved in making his own decision. And he makes sure that he gets all of the preventive services that he's learned about through the follow-up visits, through the constant motivation, through the constant education. And because of all of that, he's 100% adherent today with all of his medications. Trust building is something that has to be an essential part of giving patients the empowerment that they need, allowing them to trust us as their partners in care. And listening is something that we all have to uh, remember to constantly do so that we can peel away those layers of the onion. So what's the bottom line? FP is a perfect example of the challenges that are posed to people that live in public housing. Uh, he needs to feel that he is not alone. And his need for companionship sometimes supersedes the need for him to take care of himself. So although FP has a monthly income and a place to live, the barriers of isolation and loneliness can be extraordinar extraordinarily hard uh, for the patient to overcome, uh, sometimes making him make choices that are not the best for his health and uh, don't meet his needs. However, the custom follow-up and trust building, motivation, and continued encouragement are essential for helping this patient uh, stay within uh, a control level and feel empowered to continue to self-manage. I thank you all very much. And now I think we turn it back to Sandra. Hi, actually, this is um, Dr. Lydia Concepcion, and uh, I'll be uh, Sandra and I will be uh, both presenting uh, in a kind of team effort. Uh, as I said, um, my name is Dr. Lydia Concepcion, and Sandra and I work out of the South Bronx Health Center, which is which serves as a community-based health center funded in part by the Children's Health Fund and, and serves as an ambulatory site for the Montefiore Medical Center. Um, our program, as we have heard, uh, it has a lot of team members. So Sandra and I are co-directors of, of the Diabetes Prevention and Treatment Program. We also uh, work with every adult provider in, a, in our center. Um, we have been blessed with a senior data analyst who who is part of the STAR Center, which is a data analysis and quality improvement center that that looks at our our numbers and specifically helps us to recruit our patients. Um, so this is Sandra, and let me give you a little story, a little background about our community. Actually, we are in the Bronx, in the south part of the Bronx, in the Hunts Point and Mall Haven area, in, the, in one of the poorest congressional districts in the United States. Um, we have the highest percentage of adults with diabetes in New York City, and we also have one of the highest percentage of obesity in adults, uh, not just for New York City, but also the state and also in the whole nation. And as we know, obesity is one of the main factors for type 2 diabetes nowadays. And unfortunately, we also have a um, high prevalence of childhood obesity. And day by day, we're seeing how many more children are being diagnosed with prediabetes and diabetes at early ages. 
Um, this is not only because of genetic factors. Unfortunately, in our community, we have about 70% of our patients out of Latino descendants, but also because of all the challenges that our community faces, like such as poverty, food insecurity, and lack of places to do physical activity because of safety issues as well. And a lot of them are not bilingual, and also that makes them um, heavily literate. So uh, we have very challenged patients that deal not only with diabetes, but also with many other chronic diseases that make even more challenging the treatment of the diabetes. So Dr. Concepcion uh, is going to present one of our cases. So yeah, this is um, Mr. N, and, and, and Mr. N is a 41-year-old man who has a past medical history significant for HIV disease and hepatitis C. Um, both of those infections uh, resulted from a history of IV drug use. And currently, he's also on methadone maintenance. He presents morbidly obese with a BMI, as you can see, of greater than 60. And uh, he was also found to have dyslipidemia, hypertension. Surprisingly enough, it was only about one year ago that we diagnosed him with diabetes and with his hemoglobin A1C was 10. And so we invited Mr. N to be recruited into our intensive adult diabetes clinic. And what this is is a multidisciplinary program which has a model of care that is very patient focused. We really look at the ways to help the patient better understand and manage their condition. And this type of integrated service in fact, begins way before the patient meets with their doctor. As I think I mentioned before, we are fortunate enough here to have a professional data analyst who helps us target specific patients such that key clinical indicators are looked at. You know, we get a list of their hemoglobin A1Cs, their LDL cholesterol, and their blood pressure readings, and, and this list is provided to the doctors and is used to, to target the patients and to invite them to come in to see their doctor. So, so the message the patient is getting is your doctor has been reviewing your case and specifically wants to see you about this. So not only are the patients who, who are out of control in their key clinical indicators invited to come in, but we also address access issues in that there is this specific day that the patient gets to see their own doctor, and they're coming in with the notion that this is for their diabetes care. So we get to address the ABCs of diabetes, their vaccinations, whether they have their referrals to ophthalmology, to podiatry, without having to deal with the other acute issues or, or health care screenings that, that any provider or clinician knows can eat up a patient session in terms of time. The other thing is that any patient who hasn't been to the clinic for diabetes care in more than six months is also invited to come in. So I think the patient is, is they, they feel like they're special, they feel like my doctor is looking at my care, my doctor is focused on me, and this has resulted in a very high show rate for us, which is uh, greater than 70 percent. Um, we have outreach workers and volunteers who use the, the recruitment list, who call the patients, who set up the appointments, and um, the patients come in. So. When, when they come in, they see their doctor, but they're also met by a team of, 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 nutri of the, our nutrition service. They, they, we have our referral management team here. Um, so they feel like this is diabetes day, and 
we, we have real buy-in from the patients at this point. Does it work? Well, let's, let me tell you a little about um, Mr. N's interventions. So because Mr. N was being seen by his primary care phys physician, we knew the issues about uh, using insulin and needles in particular. He had a fear of needles, which may sound ironic, but it was his fear and um, the provider was aware of it. So instead of starting him with insulin, which was probably what is indicated, we agreed to start on oral hypoglycemics and we titrated that up so that Mr. N can see the progression of how his diabetes could get better, but ultimately he would, we were able to convince him that insulin was needed and um, over time, over the next year, citagliptin and the lantus were added, and which turns out his most recent hemoglobin A1C dropped down from 10 to 6.6. .6. So although all his clinical indicators um, were much improved, including his hemoglobin A1C, his blood pressure, his LDL, we still had the issue of him being morbidly obese. And because of the case conferences and um, that we've had as part of our team, we have decided to refer him to bariatric surgery because we know that a lot of his morbidity and maybe even his mortality, if his morbid obesity is not addressed, um, can, will come from his, from his obesity rather than his HIV disease or his hepatitis C, which at this point are non-issues. Well, um, not only for Mr. N is this working, but I also want to share with you some of the results that we had for our last study done with patients um, up to this year. And we had a total of 123 patients enrolled in our intensive diabetes clinic. And we, what we did was to compare the baseline values and the latest values for systolic growth, blood pressure, LDLs, and A1C. And what we can see here in this table is how we have actually achieved significant results, especially for blood pressure and a mean change in A1C. So we're very happy with the results. Also, what we did was to compare uh, our South Bronx Health Center patients with um, Medicaid and commercial programs, and this data comes from the National Committee for Quality Assurance for 2011. And what we're finding out is that most of our patients have achieved uh, an A1C of less than 7%. We have less patients now that are out of control with an A1C of nine, more than 9%. And we've achieved a goal of having most of our patients with an LDL less than 100. Um, these are, we want to share with you the program strengths. So one of them is the active outreach. I think that really what makes this program successful is the fact that we are there looking for the patients. We're not waiting for them to make their appointments. We are the ones who are reaching out to them to to remind them of their appointments and to making sure that they are getting the care when they need the care. Another strength is the flexibility of nutrition and diabetes education. Basically what we are doing is we're offering nutrition and diabetes education on the same day that the patient is being seen by the provider. The patients don't need to make an appointment. They are going to meet. They are meeting with the nutritionist um, the, while they are waiting for the doctors in the rooms or after the visit, anyway, we're trying to get to them as soon as we can, providing all the education on ABCs, diet, full care, medication. Uh, we're trying to empower the patients to take control of themselves and also be the ones making decisions about, the, about their own treatment. The fact that we are all under one roof really helps a lot because we can follow a medical home model. As uh, Rita said in her presentation, a lot of these patients also are presented with depression. And we have a lot of patients that need also uh, psychology, psychiatry, some kind of mental health 
help. And being that we have um, those services on site, it's easier for us when the patients are here to call one of our mental health providers to help us take care of the patient so that they get everything under one roof. Also for referrals, when they need to go to specialists who we don't have on site, we have a referral management team that does a great job actually taking care of the referrals, making sure that the patients get their appointments. We even provide transportation for those patients who, who are in need of transportation to get to their appointments. And they also follow up with the providers that get the referrals to see the patients um, met the appointments, and they take care of giving us the reports from the specialties um, so that we make sure that uh, how they are and what they are doing. Something else that we do, as Lydia briefly mentioned, is case conferences. So we do formal case conference where, where we all meet all the uh, health providers to discuss a case that is worrisome. But also we have informal case conference, even at lunchtime or, you know, the fact, again, that we're all under one roof when we're worried about the progress of a patient. We kind of bring it together and the whole, the whole medical team as a team takes the best decisions for a patient, like it's been in the case of Mr. N that we all decided, okay, this is what we need to do for him in order to make sure that he has a better life. Um, we have a lot of the patients that have I said before, you know, I ch are challenged with poverty, lack of insurance, and they don't have the means to get to their medications that, as we know, you know, can be very expensive for a diabetic patient. So we have a pharmacy assistance program that basically, uh, thanks to a couple of grants that we have, we can provide um, uh, medicine for a lot of our patients at a very low cost, so we basically cover most the cost of the medication. And of course, we have many, many community partners to make sure that they are getting, you know, the, the food that they need, the exercise that they need. Uh, and we see here the list of community resources, and we're growing every day. We're always trying to find more ways to engage our patients in our with um, resources that can provide them what they need. Um, this is a program I would like to finish uh, by saying this is a program that we didn't start um, yesterday. We basically be, we have been working on different models of care for basically the, the last eight years, uh, doing modifications of different types. You know, we started providing um, diabetes education. We started with diabetes education groups and just one-on-one -on -one visits until we finally, about three years ago, got to this model of care that we're satisfied with. It works very well for the medical providers, mental health, nutrition, diabetes education. And uh, we are all satisfied with the results. And we wish we had more time to actually share more with you. But in terms of um, lack of time, here is our contact information. We'll be very happy to share more information with you. You can reach us and we'll be happy to, to share. Thank you very much. Um, we are now going to take a few questions. So we ask if you have any questions. Um, that you will type them into the um, Q&A box on your screens. Um, if you would like to ask a question live directly to the presenters, feel free to use the raise hand feature and we will take your questions then. Thank you. Um, so the first question that we have is um, to any of the presenters. On average, how long does it take to get newly diagnosed type 2 diabetic patients to get their A1C under control? What's the average time period? Oh, I'm sorry, one second, we're just unmuting the speakers. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, this, this is Pamela. This is Pamela Weiss. 
Um, it really depends how high. Um, and you're not going to repeat an A1C for uh, two to three months, because it definitely takes a while. Uh, glucose attaches to the red blood cells, and the life of a red blood cell can be 90 to 120 days. So it'll take a while for that A1C to um, come down. The other thing is it does have to be a gradual process. You don't want it to come down from 10 to 6, like in a week. Um, so it really will depend if a person's A1C is 10 or 11, um, then it might take um, a longer uh, period of time. The other thing is you have to look at their other medical problems, uh, be it cardiovascular disease or whatever, because each person will need an individualized um, uh, goal. And as I said before, every 1% decrease will decrease their risk. So it can take um, at least three months before you're going to uh, do another A1C, it can take six months up to a year to get somebody down to where um, you might think is an acceptable um, goal. At least that's been our experience, and it's, it's so individualized. I'm going to turn it over to the others to give their experience as well. Hi, this is Dr. Concepcion, and I, I think I just want to add to that. It also depends on the patient and how if you're working with the patient to how the patient tolerates each medication, you know, when you start a medication, you really want to see the patient back two weeks later, one month later to see if they're tolerating the medication and, and what their opinion is of whether the, the medication is, is helping them and, and whether they're having any side effects. And like I like I mentioned with Mr. N, you know, he he probably needed insulin off the bat, but he was resistant to that. So we took we took our time and, and we, we we treated him in a stepwise fashion. So his results came over a year. And I and I think that it's safe to say that probably with patients, if they're starting with a hemoglobin A one C that high, that a year is probably right. Yeah, hi, this is Terry. And, uh, what I would add to that is also the identification of barriers and how long uh, you uh, take in order to identify those barriers and address them also um, have a significant effect on how long a patient will take to come into control. Um, in, in FP's case, he was also very resistant to starting insulin, and denial was one of his barriers. Um, so until we addressed every single barrier uh, with the patient, uh, he really, um, you know, didn't come into control. But once those barriers were addressed, he did. Well, this is Sandra, and you know, from the point of view of education, I think that it also has, um, it's important to know that, you know, if a patient is encouraged to make changes, not only to be compliant with the medications, but also it's willing to make changes regarding, regarding the diet and the exercise, and the patient is um, um, much more successful with the treatment as well. You know, the medications work much uh, better when they are in company of the diet and exercise component. So it also depends on the motivation that the patient has to make changes and take control of their diabetes. Excellent. Thank you. And Pam, we would like to ask you, as we were talking about barriers, um, if you can share with us um, what do you see across the U.S. as some of the additional barriers to reducing type 2 diabetes? Um, well, we discussed many of them. One, I think, is um, availability of, let's say, even like safety for a physical activity. Two would be um, like food deserts. Um, can people get uh, nutritious food? Sometimes um, the cheapest food is going to be very, very um, high in calories or fat or whatever. So um, access to uh, physical activity, access to um, healthy food. The other thing, um, as was brought up, health literacy. It's really difficult, uh, no matter, a person could be literate, but might have health literacy problems. We also have illiteracy problems as well. 
um, it's very difficult to understand an entire lifestyle management um, system. So it has to be stepwise, one thing at a time. Um, I think mental health issues are very important, as, as in these were mentioned. And sometimes a person might present with a terrible A1C, but also depression. And there is some literature that if you treat the depression, then often they'll become more compliant with their diabetes regimen. So therefore, the clinical measures of their um, diabetes will improve as well. Uh, also, a decrease in the amount of physical activity. People are at the screen, whether it's the TV or whether it's the computer. Uh, you know, um, so the decreased everyday physical activity. So I think those are definitely the trends. Decreased access to healthy food um, and uh, health literacy, physical activity issues, um, and sometimes access to care to try to treat them as well. Mm -hmm. Great. It, uh, there's a comment and a question from someone else that says, it is interesting that the HIV and hepatitis C are not the most pressing problem. Um, do all of you see this commonly? Um, and how much of the challenge of managing diabetes may be from, I know Pam just touched on that, um, from coexisting mental disease, if you see it, these in the your patient populations? Yes, hi, this is Terry. I would like to say that uh, depression is definitely a significant issue with uh, chronic diseases uh, like diabetes, HIV, hepatitis. Uh, these are all conditions where people uh, have to live with them on a daily basis for the rest of their lives. And uh, patient exhaustion does happen. Uh, most of my diabetics do experience uh, a certain level of depression uh, that has to be addressed. And I totally agree with uh, Lydia. Uh, the depression does have to be uh, addressed, treated, uh, whether it's by uh, navigating the patient through the system and getting them some counseling or uh, consulting with the provider and uh, getting them on an, uh, on an antidepressant medication. Uh, that's a very, very important issue that I think all of us as care providers have to deal with with, with diabetes. Thank you. Great, thank you. And um, one of the presenters had mentioned there's a training book for promotores. Um, how can someone find a copy of that publication? Oh, okay. Yes, the Road to Health Toolkit, and there's a training video um, for, for, for the promotores. I mean, there may be other um, uh, resources out there, but the Road to Health uh, training, if you go to the NDEP website um, and look under Road to Health, there is um, a training video. Um, and if you email me, I'll be sure that the person in charge, who's um, Betsy Rodriguez, can follow up as well. But you can get that training video, just order it if you go to the NDEP uh, website. But uh, you can also email me, and I'll be sure that you get one. Wonderful. Thank you. And again, um, we're close to the 2 o'clock hour, and I don't see any further questions in the queue. Um, so I would like to thank all of you. Um, Dr. Allwise, Dr. Concepcion, Dr. Ramirez, um, Sandra, Sandra, I hope I don't say your name incorrectly, Aravalo, and uh, Terry Lawson. Thank you so much for today's presentation. I think for most of the um, grantees uh, who the Health Center programs on the call today, I think this has been very, very helpful information. Um, thank you for sharing your models of care, your best practices. Um, and as we know, these are models that can be translated uh, throughout the public housing communities um, and the programs. And so we want to let everyone know that today's presentation will be available on our website immediately following the webinar. Um, we will provide both the PowerPoint slides as well as the audio version. Um, you can go to the website at www.nchph.org 
Um, and we will also have all the available links that were shared during the presentations available as well, as well as um, any other resources from all of that our presenters have alluded to during their presentation. And feel free to contact us here at North American Management. Any one of us on the staff will be more than willing to help um, not only provide you with um, some the solutions for your particular issues on diabetes management, but we can also share um, your information with our expert, expert panelists um, so they can provide you with the additional information if necessary. So again, I would like to thank everyone for joining us for today's presentation. It's a very important topic especially in our public housing um, community. And we thank all of our experts for sharing these best practices with us today. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's call. Thanks. Goodbye.